All right, I think the number is starting to slow up, isn't it? Shall we go ahead and get started, Allie? Good morning, everyone. Welcome to this um, online workshop um, for dissertation projects, introduction to secondary analysis for qualitative and quantitative data. My name is Maureen Haker, and I've been working with the UK Data Service for over 10 years now on everything from um, ingesting data to uh, reuse projects. And I also teach research methods and sociology at University of Suffolk. And I'm here with my colleague, Ali. Do you want to introduce yourself? Thanks, Maureen. Hi, everyone. I'm Ali. Um, I've worked with the UK Data Service since 2020. I'm part of the surveys team in user support and training, but I also work on creating uh, various online materials for students. Um, and other online resources. So without further ado, shall we go ahead and get started? Um, we're just gonna turn off our videos to make sure that our streaming remains um, unfettered by uh, uh, the Wi-Fi. All right, so what we're planning to do today is go over what secondary analysis is and have a look at um, some of the key methodological issues related to reuse projects for both qualitative and for quantitative data. But before we get knee deep in that, I want to give a very brief overview of the UK Data Service for those who have not had um, the pleasure of being able to explore the archive yet. And, uh, and then I'll sort of zoom right into qualitative uh, data and then switch over back to Ali for qualitative data. But before we get too far along, I just want to address a simple point first. What is secondary analysis? So in short, secondary analysis asks new questions of old data. It's analyzing data that you have not collected yourself. So usually researchers collect far more data than they actually need for their own research question. So think of, for example, national surveys, which collect a lot of data on a representative sample, or qualitative studies, which will have interviews that last for one or two hours, sometimes more. And those data sets can answer a lot of different questions and they can be analyzed using a lot of different techniques. So secondary analysis makes use and does just that. It reuses that data that's been collected by somebody else. But there is a complicated nuance around the terminology. So you may have heard of other terms to describe the method, including secondary data analysis, or, um, and I've already said this one, reuse projects, and they all refer to the same exact method. So don't get too confused by that. But there is an ongoing debate about what to call the method. So in 2007, um, Libby Bishop wrote this article on primary secondary dualism, basically making the argument that there may be a privileging of methods where you go out and collect data yourself and using terms like secondary analysis or secondary data reinforces this kind of hierarchy. But actually, primary and secondary analysis are a lot more similar than different if you fully consider the key methodological issues of secondary analysis as a method. So consequently, you'll find uh, a, you know, increasing use of the term data reuse. Um, and that's a term we'll probably use throughout this workshop. And it just takes into account the huge ways that data can be used and reused. And it doesn't imply that any of those projects are secondary to the initial use of data. So you can use whatever term comes to mind first, but be aware there's a few different ways of describing this process of reusing data. So now you know what secondary analysis is, but where would you find data that's already been collected? And this is where the UK Data Service, which holds the largest collection of social science data in the UK, comes in. So it's a comprehensive resource that's funded by the ESRC. And the main job is to be a single point of access to a wide range of social science data. So the main purpose then is the collection, the ingest and the processing of data and further dissemination of that data for people to use. But in addition to that archive data infrastructure core, we also have a service layer which provides extensive support, training and guidance. 
Who is it for? We like to think really it's for anyone who has an interest in data. So traditionally, our main audience and the people who probably both deposit and use the data the most tend to be academic researchers and students. A lot of other groups are well represented too, including government analysts, charities, foundations, businesses, research centers, think tanks, all give us and use data. Um, given the importance of data and how it's used and how it's disseminated, there's a real effort to try and make sure that the UK data service reaches out to a wide range of communities. What kinds of data do we hold? The majority of the data, at least judging by the number of collections, is certainly quantitative data. So we hold over 9,000 collections, of which over 7,000 collections are quantitative. And we hold a wide variety of that data. So there's survey data, both cross-sectional and longitudinal, aggregate statistics, domestic and international macro data, um, as well as census data and micro data. And then of course, we do also have a fairly large collection of qualitative and mixed methods data. And where does it come from? Again, that varies depending on the data type. And some of the sources um, uh, that you see here, including the agencies and statistical time series, those are gonna be the main sources of quantitative data. Most of our qualitative and mixed methods comes through individual academics who have received a research grant to do their research. Um, and also, of course, we hold some originally paper-based public records and historical sources, um, and that includes things like the census. So where can you find information? There's a website, ukdataservice.ac.uk, and that holds quite a lot of information. From there, you can find the data catalog, and there's also hundreds of pages which discuss methodological issues like gaining consent, anonymizing data, storing data. There's also some student-specific tutorials like our data skills modules. Um, there's some workbooks and exercises based on collections that we hold. And there's also help pages. So if you have very specific questions, those help pages might be um, of use. But getting back to dissertation projects. So what kind of research projects uh, can you do reusing data from the archive? And to answer this, we really need to go back to the beginning and think about the research process. So you're hopefully familiar with this model. It starts with a sort of general direction or a topic for your research. You do some background literature that's already written on your topic. And from there, you ask a research question that builds on that body of research. And once you have the research question, you then decide the best way to answer that question and design your project. And once you've settled on your method, you actually go out and collect the data, analyze it, and begin your write-up. And that's what you would submit for your dissertation. And you know that process might have a few extra steps, or it might swap a couple of steps depending on your theoretical foundation. But generally speaking, this is how we normally think of the research process. Um, when you're doing a project using secondary analysis, this process is going to look a little bit different. So this model clearly shows how the research question is built from the chosen topic area. Um, and it'll be based on your preliminary search and probably the literature that you find. But with a secondary analysis project, the research question is derived directly from the data. So you start with the topic that you're interested in, but instead of looking for literature, you look for data and you start evaluating collections and you see what data exists on your topic. Once you find a collection that intrigues you, you then ask a question, a research question of that data. And from there, you would find what literature exists um, on that question. And then of course, there's no need to collect data you just need to access it, which is of course one of the key advantages of secondary analysis. The data is already collected, you just need to get your hands on it, either by downloading it from the catalog page, or um, you know, once in a while you might actually need to go to the archive if it's only available in paper form. 
That's a little bit more unusual now than it used to be in the past. Most things you can probably download. <clears throat> Once you have it, you then analyze it and you'll write up your dissertation. So the key point that I'm trying to make here around reusing data for a dissertation project is about where your research question comes from. So it would take a lot of time and inside knowledge about the data that already exists in the archive in order to be able to just come up with a research question and then find the perfect data to answer it. You'd be searching for the perfect data for a really long time, unless you, know, you already have a good working knowledge about those collections that are held at the archive. So for a dissertation project, when your time and your resources are limited, you'll wanna look at the data first and from there develop your research question that gives you a new take on that data. And you can of course spend time looking for the right data, but for a dissertation project, you may wanna look first and see what data exists on the general topic area before nailing down a specific research question. With that being said, it's probably important to have some kind of idea of the kind of project you want to do. So we're talking about research design here. So while you might be exploring data without a specific question in mind, you might want to think about the actual design and layout of your project. So there's four types of reuse projects that will lend themselves well to dissertation projects. And these are reanalysis, replication, comparative and restudy. So reanalysis is probably the one that comes to mind when thinking about secondary analysis. So this usually involves thinking about the wide range of approaches you can take in the analysis of the data set. Um, and it usually means asking a kind of different research question from what the original researchers were trying to do. So for example, five seal and charter is black. Uh, did a, a study using comparative keyword analysis of illness narratives. Now, the original illness narratives had been looked at exclusively for health research. So the interviews were meant to explore how diagnoses are made. But when SEAL and Charter is Black came along to do the comparative keyword analysis, they were much more interested in looking at the discussions between patients and doctors rather than the actual health issues that came up in the interviews. So the key question that you're asking can be very different in that kind of way. Or sometimes the question's on a similar topic to the original research, but it has a slightly different focus. So another example is Joanna Bornat, who uh, looked at gerontology as a topic. And she found two different data sets looking specifically at gerontology. But Bornat's research was on racism, which wasn't the focus of the original work, but that data set was rich enough to allow her to explore racism within gerontology. Um, and so she was able to reuse that existing data. If you wanna use the same exact analysis strategy um, with the same kind of research question, you'd be doing a replication study. And that's also something that's possible. So right now there's a real concern about reproducibility of research and replication studies um, are a really good way to reveal some of the messiness that's involved in working through data. And there's a really infamous example of replication from Thomas Herndon, who is a postgraduate student at University of Mad Massachusetts. Um, so he was assigned an assessment to replicate the results from a published study. So he chose Reinhardt and Rogoff's 2010 paper, Growth in the Time of Debt. And basically, this paper came up with the proportion at which your national debt can be of your GDP before you start to see negative economic growth. So Thomas Herndon pulled the OECD data to rerun the analysis as the paper had laid out, but he got a completely different answer. So the paper um, published said that the debt cannot exceed 90% of your GDP. However, he calculated that the debt can actually exceed your GDP. And even then, it only has a minimal impact on the economy. So um, he ended up needing to contact the original investigators um, who sent them the actual data file that they had worked from. And he found a flaw in their data set where some cells had been miscopied. 
So the full story of this is published in 2013 in the New Yorker. And a replication study hopefully won't always find a, a flaw like that in the original study, but it's nonetheless a, a design that might be worth considering if it helps you develop an appreciation for the research process. Or you could even develop a project whereby you rerun a series of studies on the same topic, or you explore a complicated data set that's got all kinds of, you know, missing data or you needing to transform variables and so on. You can also do comparative work. So you might be looking at uh, an international comparison between two countries or comparing social groups of the population based on a shared social characteristic. We do have some key data pages for quantitative data sets, and that outlines some of the large national surveys that are held at the archive, any of which would allow you to do some comparative work without having to collect two sets of data. So you could compare samples across um, geographic place, across gender or ethnicity, or which might be impossible to do uh, other, without secondary analysis, you could compare samples across time. Um, so these characteristics are usually collected as a standard for those larger surveys. So the final um, reuse, I'm gonna exemplify with a case study. And this is a restudy. And this is where you replicate not the analysis, but the methods of the study and um, purely for purposes of comparison. So there's a bit of secondary analysis here, but it also allows you some uh, scope to collect a little bit of your own data too. So the example of this kind of reuse project is from a collection called School Leaver Studies. And this original study <clears throat> was conducted by Ray Paul in the late seventies as part of a much wider community study on the Isle of Sheppey. So as part of that project, Paul asked teachers to set a particular essay just before students were due to leave school, prompting them to imagine that they were reaching the end of their life and something you know, made them think back to the time they left school. So they were assigned to write a short essay of what happened over their life for the next 30 to 40 years. So in 2009, Graham Crow, who's pictured on the left there, and Don Lyon, and that's not Don Lyon next to him, that's, that's Ray Paul, decided to reanalyze this data set and focus solely on student aspirations. So using the very same methodology, they conducted a restudy of school leavers on the Isle of Sheppey in 2009. And the prompt that they supplied the students um, was very nearly the same. Imagine you're at the end of your life, reflect on what you've done since leaving school. And they then transcribed those essays, compared the themes of those set of essays to the set of essays that was collected by Ray Paul. And you can see just a little snippet there at the bottom of one of those essays. So what happens um, in the span of 40 years? How do aspirations actually change? Well, in 1978, students expected much more grounded and arguably mundane sorts of jobs. Career progression was gradual and it followed on from hard work. And there were sometimes talks of periods of unemployment or quite morbidly um, their death or the early death of someone they loved. So you can see a few examples in the left column there of some of the quotations from the essays, um, such as the one at the bottom, I longed for something exciting and challenging, but yet again, I had to settle for second best. I began working in a large clothes factory. 2010, um, however, showed that students were imagining well-paid and instantaneous jobs that were filled with a lot of choice, but also a lot of uncertainty. And Crow and his research team also noted a clear influence of celebrity culture in those essays. So for example, you have the quote at the bottom of the girl who writes, in my future, I wanna become either a dance teacher, a hairdresser, or a professional show jumper, horse rider. If I do become a dancer, my dream would be to dance for Beyonce or someone really famous. So this study is actually quite large. Um, and I think it's really important to note that, you know, you need to be realistic about what you can accomplish in a dissertation project. Um, this particular study of school leavers was, uh, you know, intended to engage the community alongside the research and find innovative ways of including participants in the research outputs 
So as part of that initiative, they published a living and working on Sheffy website, and they helped sort of create a shared history and memory of what living on the Isle of Sheppey means for the community. So this is definitely, I think, an ambitious project, but it's a good example of how you might combine a bit of data collection with a bit of data reuse. And for those of you who are doing PhD work, this might be something that you would consider, but for others, you could design a more feasible project where you're just collecting a few interviews or something like that um, alongside uh, reanalyzing a few interviews. So hopefully you're budding with ideas of what you wanna look for uh, in the archives and the kind of project you might do reusing data. But since you're not collecting data yourself, um, you'll find that there's very few ethical considerations. Um, and so hopefully you wouldn't hit so many snags with ethical review boards. But that doesn't mean that there aren't any ethical considerations. So there's two key points that I wanna make before diving into qualitative and quantitative data. And the first of these is around access. How do you get permission to use the data? So if you're using an established archive like the UK Data Service, there is um, already a license negotiated with the person who deposited the data. Um, and so that usually means you just need to sign what's called the end user license. And this is a legal document. Um, it's pictured on the left there, but there's two really important points on there. One is that you can't share the data onward, including with your supervisor. So if they need to help you with your analysis or anything like that, they will need to register and download the data themselves. And that would mean that they also sign the end user license. Um, so you also shouldn't be sharing your login, for example, um, with anyone else, um, because it would mean they also can get access to that data without signing the end user license themselves. The second point is that, you know, all of the data has been anonymized, um, and that is likely going to be the case if you're reusing data from an archive. But just because it's anonymized doesn't necessarily mean it's completely impossible to ever figure out any of the identities of participants. It's extremely unlikely, but this end user license basically says that if you do inadvertently uncover an identity of a participant, then you won't reveal that identity to anyone. So uh, just make sure that you understand those two key points when signing that license. And then once you've sorted out access, the second point I wanna uh, make sure you ensure is that you cite the data. So citing data helps data creators track the impact of their study. It also supports reproducibility and it makes it easier to find the data that you used for your project. Um, we do have a page on uh, the importance of citing the data, and we've tried to take the pain out of this process um, by giving you the citation on the catalog page. So the citation you would see under citation and copyright, um, and then you can just literally copy and paste that. You can even change the citation format if needed. So you've got access. You sorted out the citation, but now comes actually doing secondary analysis. So I'm gonna talk through some examples of qualitative data and a couple of key issues, um, and then I'll switch over to Ali. So when you first download a qualitative data set, you'll get a zipped folder, which looks a bit like this, and you've got some folders that are just stuffed with files. So most qualitative data is held as what are called RTFs, um, so to find the data, you're probably going to look in the RTF folder. And this folder, once it's opened, would look like this. Um, so here you are, all of your folder, uh, all of your data files nicely organized in one folder. So clicking on one of these files would open up uh, something which looks a bit like this. So this is a snippet of the school leader study essay um, and what it looks like in its entirety. So the RTF folder for this collection has over 100 of those files, but the files don't just have to be essays or interview transcripts. You might, for example, have some PDFs of handwritten notes like in the upper left or some ethnographic notes on the right side. And a couple of collections may also have some images or videos like those on the lower uh, uh, left-hand corner. 
But most likely you'll open up an interview transcript like this one um, from the affluent worker. So it should have some clear turn taking and some speaker tags so you know who is talking. And there's also a lot of different types of that data available. So, you know, make sure you have a good look through the collection first and, and see, see what's in there. Might be focus group uh, transcripts. It might be one-to-one -one transcripts. They could be life history transcripts and so on. So the next thing that you need to do, once you know what kind of data you're working with, is orient yourself to the project. And I think the main point here is to not underestimate the amount of time that it's going to take to get acquainted with the data sets. So there might be multiple levels of context to get through in order to actually understand the data. And what I mean by that is you might have more than just the data that's collected at the time of the interview or data collection. You might also have to consider the basic social characteristics of the participants or the historical time period in which the data was collected or where the data was collected. So really the idea is that you need to understand the data set as a whole in order to really get at the root of what the data can convey. And every collection at the UK Data Service has some kind of documentation that's provided with the data set, which is a really useful starting point. So it usually contains information on the methodology, such as an interview schedule or a call for participants, or sometimes it includes segments from publications arising out of the original study, or it might have a funding application. So for qualitative uh, data sets, this documentation is called a user guide. And here's an example of a user guide. This one does happen to have an interview guide for interviewers, as well as the consent form, a sample profile, and so on. It's just further background information to help you understand how the data was collected. But what about the participants themselves? So every qualitative study also has uh, what's called a data listing. Um, and here's an example of one of these. And it's basically a, a, a table which gives you a brief overview of the data in the collection. So each row represents a piece of data or even a participant. Um, and each column lists some sort of characteristic or attribute of that interview. So it's a quick way to kind of get a good glance at who took part in this study. And in addition to the context of the data, you may also need to consider the sample. So for example, if the data set's too large, you may need to take a subsample. Um, qualitative collections tend to be smaller anyways, but many of the archive data sets are funded and they do collect a considerable amount of data. So for a small dissertation project, uh, you'll need to be realistic about you know, how much of that data you actually use. Um, so for example, the Edwardians collection, which was put together by Paul Thompson, and it's widely considered to be the first oral history of Britain, that contains 453 80 plus page uh, interviews. Conversely, I would expect most dissertation projects probably have an expectation of maybe like six to 10 interviews or something along those lines. So you would need a clear sampling strategy to help you decide which of those interviews that you want to look at. Look at. <clears throat> you might also be interested in a particular subgroup of the population. So again, think about what is the criteria? Can you pick out your participants that way? Um, and you might also want to combine data from uh, different data collections that kind of complement each other. So uh, I think the thing to keep in mind with that is it does mean that it would take more time to sift through and find the different data sets to pull together. Um, but it is another possibility uh, if you feel that the data all speaks to the same topic and research question, and you've done a bit of work recontextualizing that to ensure that the interviews actually work together. Um, so I'm gonna hand over to Ali now to start talking about quantitative data. Thanks, Maureen. Bear with me, everyone, just while we swap our slides again. Um, great. So, yeah, thanks. Um, as Maureen said, I'm going to give a quick rundown of the key things you need to consider if you're using a dissertation, uh, doing a dissertation using quantitative data. 
So I'm going to cover the key things you need to consider in two main areas when you're selecting your data and also when you're getting to grips with and understanding it. So selecting your data. So some of you might already know which topic area you want to look at or explore for your dissertation. But if not, I thought I'd just put together an idea of the data available and some of the data sets that cover these topics. So the data available from the UK Data Service covers a wide range of topics. These include things like the environment. So for that, you could use the OECD environment statistics. You could also look at workforce patterns using the labor force survey, various aspects of healthcare using either the health survey for England for general health, the psychiatric morbidity surveys for mental health and well-being, or the dental health surveys for dental health. If you're interested in family spending, you could look at the family resources survey. If you wanted to know about attitudes to the police and criminal justice system, there are various crime surveys available. The time use uh, surveys tell you how people spend their days. And in particular, there are some really interesting surveys on time use during the pandemic. And if you are interested in attitudes and political opinions, you might want to look at the British Social Attitudes Survey. But these are just examples and there are many more topics and also many more data sets that would cover uh, these topics as well. Um, and if you want a bit of a further idea of the kind of ways that our data have been used, do take a look at the impact section of our website. This will show you um, how data sets have been used by real people in industry and research. So that could give you kind of a starting point um, to see how the data can be used. So back to um, thinking about your project. So I've started with topic because, as Maureen said earlier, you'd have to know the data sets very well to find the perfect one to answer your question. So instead, I want to think about this as a process of refining our project and questions as we explore the data. So let's say you now have a general idea of your topic area and you're starting to think about the data that you might use to explore it. A good place to start is by thinking about what you're trying to measure. This is really particularly key for quantitative projects um, because you need to know the concepts you want to measure so you can relate these to variables within a data set. So what do I mean by this? So for example, let's say we were interested in looking at the relationship between fear of crime and age. So our key concepts here are fear of crime and age. So we need to find some quantitative data which has variables that measure these concepts that will allow us to formulate and or answer a research question about them. Because as Maureen said earlier, it's hard to find a perfect data set, it's easier to start from this broader topic and then derive your concepts and questions from the existing variables within the data set. That said, if you do already have a question in mind, maybe you have it from a research proposal assignment or a previous discussion with your supervisor, you can search for data in line with this, but just keep in mind you might have to be flexible and revise it based on what variables are available. So if you're looking for data on your key topics, there are a few places you can start. I'm going to give you a quick overview, but there is more information about this on the website. So as mentioned earlier, could you, you could use our theme pages to look for key data sets on a theme. If you are interested in searching our whole collection, you could type keywords, keywords into the data catalog. You could also use our variable and question bank. This is a really useful tool that lets you search for particular questions within data sets. Um, but please be aware, not all the studies we hold are held within the variable and question bank. So if you find a data set that looks promising, it might be worth searching the catalogue for the latest version of that data set. And you can also use the HACCP thesaurus, which lets you search by key social science concepts. And links to all of these can be found on the Find Data section of our website. And we will have a practice in the practical part of this session as well. So once you find a data set that you think might be suitable, you need to consult the catalog page. This will give you an overview of the key topics, the background and a brief overview of the methodology. You can also access the documentation from here. Uh, quantitative studies usually in include user guides, technical reports, and really interestingly for us, uh, when you're searching for your data, the list of variables included. There might also be further documents uh, showing changes that have been made since the data was originally deposited as well. So make sure you take a good look at that. So the list of variables can usually be found in the documentation. 
uh, as I said, usually in the user guide, the variable list, or something called a code book or data dictionary. If you're ever unsure about whether a variable is in a data set, always check the code book because that is generated from the data set itself. So if the variable's in that code book, it is definitely in the data set. So back to our example, say we wanted data on crime, we might choose to look at the crime survey for England and Wales. This is a large survey and it looks like it might cover our key topics. So it's a really interesting use of data, uh, interesting source of data about crime because the statistics are independent from those held in police records. It is a repeated cross-sectional survey. It's conducted every year and it has a sample of 35,000 individuals aged 16 plus and a small sample of um, those aged 10 to 15. So back to our variables, if I have a look in the code book for the crime survey for England and Wales, I can see there are two variables that might measure our concepts. Qual life, which measures, measures how much your own quality of life is affected by fear on a scale of one to 10, and age, which measures the respondent's age. So we found these variables, but now we need to think about think carefully about whether they're suitable. And I want to point out that a really important step with qualitative data, uh, quantitative data is to think critically about what the variables measure. So take, for example, our qualified variable. Does this really measure fear of crime or is it actually measuring how much fear of crime affects someone's life? And with all of your variables, this is something you'll need to think about and consider what is the question really asking and if you want to understand the original question further, you can usually find the original questionnaire in the documentation as well. As well as considering your variables and concepts, you might also want to consider what kind of analysis you can do with the data. So if you're interested in looking at individuals at a particular time point, you might want to use a cross-sectional survey. If you want to look at data over time, you could look at repeated cross-sections or longitudinal data. If you're really interested in particular small geographic areas, you could look at census data. And if you want to compare countries over time, you could look at international time series data. It's also important to think about your population. So that's the group that you want to measure. So this might be the population of the world, the UK, or maybe a particular city or local authority area. You also need to consider your unit of analysis. So are you interested in looking at individual people, or households. And this will affect the data that you use as some data sets are only available for certain geographies or certain units. It's important to remember that the process isn't linear. As Maureen said, you might need to go back and forth and realign your data, uh, realign your question with the available data. And you might need to choose different variables in order to do this. So once you've chosen your data set, uh, there are a few final things you need to consider. So I'm just going to go through quickly a little bit about understanding your data. So as we said, the documentation usually contains information on the variables available, but it should also have information on the questionnaire used to collect the data. And to understand secondary data, it's also really important to understand how the data was collected and the process of that. And something that's really particularly important is routing, and that's who was asked which question. This is because many questionnaires use something called computer-aided interviewing, which makes it easy to send respondents through the questionnaire by different routes, depending on their previous answers. So you might ask someone, how old are you? And then if they say they're under 16, you wouldn't bother asking them questions about work because maybe the, you know, they're less likely to work and the data producers are only interested in those over 16 who are working. So this means that many questions in the survey are only applicable to some of the sample. So it's always a good idea to check the documentation to see who was asked about the variables you're interested in. So this is an example from the documentation uh, from the Labour Force survey. It's a variable called Flex 10. And if you look down at the bottom here underneath, it says that the question is asked if the respondent is in work and then where it says applies if in work during reference week. All of the information under that tells you how they identified who was in work based on their responses to other questions or variables. And you'll find the documentation looks a bit different across different data sets, but this gives you a general idea of what to expect. 
You can also find information about how the data was processed after collection. So derived variables are variables that are created from the raw data. And here's an example of this. So that flex 10 variable that we talked about on the previous slide, um, it asked about zero hours contract. That was one of the options. But say we were interested in just looking at those who did work zero hours contract, zero hours, yeah, work with a zero hours contract. We can see here that the data producers have derived a variable called flex W7 based on this flex 10 variable. So everyone who answered yes, they worked a zero hours contract, were then coded into this new variable um, if they responded that they had on the previous variable. Um, and this figure shows how this has been done. Not all documentation contains these diagrams, and in some surveys, it will just be the SPSS or status syntax that shows you how the variable has been derived. But it's really important you understand the origin of any variables that you're using. You also need to think about sampling. Surveys and any similar quantitative data sets are almost always based on samples. And one important question you need to ask about your data is, is the sample representative? So you need to know who is included. Is it adults, only those who live in private addresses? Uh, so that would miss out things like hospitals and care homes. What was the response rate? And is there any information about differential response across the population? This will tell you about potential bias. And you also need to find out if you need to use a survey weight in order to make the data representative. And again, all of this can be found in the documentation. A second and final question you need to ask is whether you have enough cases to make a precise estimate. For example, the Crime Survey for England and Wales has a large sample size, which should allow for precise estimates. However, if you were interested in analysing a particular subpopulation, so for example, those with disabilities, uh, those of certain ethnic minority groups, there might be insufficient cases in the sample to make precise estimates. And I've just given a general overview about sampling considerations, but there are further resources uh, available on the website as well. So just to summarise, you need to think about your key concepts, what you're trying to measure, and relate these to variables in a data set. Always check the catalogue or documentation to help you understand your data and make sure you're considering sampling within, um, within the process of choosing and preparing your data. So that concludes the summary of quantitative data. I'm now just gonna run through some quick useful dissertation resources that we have available, and then we'll move on to the practical part of the session and also the questions. So some of our dissertation resources that are available on the website can be found if you go to Home, Learning Hub, and then to the student pages. They contain information on what data is available to you, how to find and access data, our dissertation award, and further resources. In general, you can also explore our Learning Hub and our data skills module as well, which give you introductions to working with different types of data. So survey data, um, longitudinal data, aggregate data, and then there's a themed module on crime um, and coding in R. In particular, relevant to what we've covered here today, I want to draw your attention to our finding and accessing data for your project pages. These contain worksheets, videos, and guidance to help you go through the kind of things we've been thinking about today. So identifying your data needs, searching for and evaluating uh, data for your project. Also, if you are working on a dissertation that has been or will be submitted as part of the 2024-2025 academic year, please consider submitting it for our dissertation award. We recognize the three uh, best undergraduate dissertations that are on social science topics and use data from the catalogue. Each winner will receive a £300 award and the deadline is midday on the 18th of June 2025. So please uh, have a look on the website if you're interested in submitting your dissertation for that as well. Finally, follow hashtag UKDS dissertations on X, formerly Twitter, for the latest updates on our resources and further events. So now we are going to move on to the activity part of today's workshop. So we've got some worksheets to help you get started and then we'll come back together and we'll share the answers in Mentimeter. 
So I'm just going to pop the first of these worksheets um, in the chat. So this worksheet is all about finding data. Uh, bear with me, everyone. If I share my screen and then I will um, find it. So let's see. There we go. So this is our first task. So you want to go to the data catalog and have a search around to analyze, uh, to look for qualitative data sets. And then you can have a go at finding data on either a topic of interest, a particular topic, or um, practice searching for a particular data set. Oh, and we've got the link in the chat as well for anyone that needs it. Thanks, Emma. So we'll give about uh, eight to 10 minutes for that. And then if you're, when you finish that, please just pop in the chat and then we'll know to move on to the next task. Thanks everyone. As you're looking for um, uh, data sets, if you do have any questions, please feel free to use the Q&A box um, and, and we can help uh, kind of troubleshoot if you're having any issues or if you have any questions um, about looking for data. We'll, be, we'll have its own series page, which gives you general information about the series. And then the studies, Thanks, Maureen. And I'm just going, we're sort of coming to the end of this section. So I'm just going to pop the next worksheet on the screen. Um, so this one is looking at catalogue and documentation um, information. So I'm just going to swap the worksheet to our final um, worksheet now. So this one is about exploring a download bundle. And then after we finish this task, we're all going to come back together and we'll feed back on Mentimeter, wrap up and take any more questions. So just to say for this final worksheet, this is an open data set. So you do not need to yet register and sign any end user license in order to be able to download. This is one of the ones that's under Creative Commons with no, no particular uh, restrictions on the use of it. So um, you should just be able to download. So um, we're going to come back and uh, please do continue popping any questions in the chat because we will have a bit further time for them at the end. But we're going to go over to Mentimeter now. The code is on there at the top um, of the screen. Um, and we're going to just go through and feedback some of the answers from these worksheets. So uh, what data set did you find when you were searching um, for data? Are there any particular data sets that you came um, across. And if you can't use Menti, feel free to pop it in the general webinar chat as well. I can see someone said that they found a health communication data set, or oh, someone's found a, question, a data set on parenting, diet and behavior during COVID. That sounds interesting. Oh, housing condition survey. Yeah, that's very interesting. One about SMEs. Um, the housing condition survey is actually a really interesting survey because it's got a um, physical survey of the house alongside the questionnaire. Um, that's asked to the participants. So that's really fascinating as well. Organizational change towards zero carbon, policies data on um, disability as well. And COVID-19 data, yes, we do have a lot of um, COVID-19 data. I worked on pulling um, our theme page together for that during um, the pandemic. So um, yeah, lots of interesting data there and the general crime data, great. So now onto the catalogue and documentation task. I'm testing you a bit because this was our first um, task. So can you remember what is the observation unit for the survey? Is it households and families, individuals or both? Let's give everyone a second to, sorry, bear with my, uh, my screen's just frozen, typical. I'll let everyone keep answering. You can see we've got some stuff in the chat. Maureen, can you just keep an eye on the chat for a second? Sorry, my screen is um, freezing. Yeah, no worries. So we've got both. And then we've got a couple of people saying household or families um, as well. Um, yeah, so the correct answer is uh, both. So there is data on families and households and individuals. And that can be found in the coverage and methodology section of the um, catalogue page. So what country does this data cover? You might have just spotted it on the answer to the previous um, question. So yeah. Lots of people saying United Kingdom. And yeah, that is correct. Again, it can be found in the coverage and methodology section. And finally, what topic examples did you come across um, within 
the um, documentation. Now you're really stretching them. <laughs> I know because it was so uh, so far back. <laughs> so yeah, working at home. I'll just give a couple of minutes. I know I'm I'm pulling everyone's uh, memories. Feel free to pop it in the Zoom chat as well if you don't have access to Mentimeter. Homeschooling, social contact, working from home. I can see we've got in the chat as well. Volunteering. Yes, it looks like we're covering most of the topics so the pioneers of social religious belief so yeah here we go so here's an example of some of the topics so yeah background variables socio-demographic variables working at home uh, health and well-being homeschooling social contact volunteering um, and again that's found within the documentation so part two um, we're looking at our mixed method study now so what country do the data cover We've got england the uk UK in the chat as well. I'll give everyone a minute or so to remind themselves. UK again, England. Oh, we're, we're a bit divided here. Let's see um, what the answer is. It is England. And again, that's found in the coverage and the methodology section of the catalogue page. Uh, and what kind of data are these? So just to remind everyone, that is the COVID-19 um, burden and impacting care homes mixed method study data. So let's see, we've got most people saying text. Give a minute or so for some more answers. OK, um, and the answer is, yep, they are text data. And I know I keep flagging this coverage and methodology section, but it is really good way to um, understand the data at a glance, to look at those things like those observation units and the coverage and whether it is relevant to your topic and your um, question that you're interested in. And finally, um, how many interviews were added to the Pioneers collection in April 2019? So this is the question in the bundle um, and download task. We've got 16, 6, 16. I wonder if they meant to write 16 instead of the yes. 6. <laughs> yeah. So hopefully you were able to, to kind of have a little look through the um, download bundle um, and open up the files with ease and just kind of see what kind of documentation and what those data files look like when you open them. But those readme files can be really helpful. So that was straight out of the readme file. And the readme file, there's one in every single collection. And it just says a little bit about the digitization and ingest processes. So it just helps you kind of know what was done to the data. Um, so they're useful things to just have a glance at when you're looking through um, a download bundle. Great. So that's the end of our, um, our Mentimeter questions. So I'm just going to reshare the screen again. And Maureen's just going to give um, a little bit of information on some kind of final um, resources. Yeah. Yeah. So um, here we just I just wanted to give you a bit of a listing of some of our recent acquisitions um, just to kind of see the breadth of topics, uh, which you have probably already uncovered from doing some of these exercises. But, you know, there's quite a lot of data that we hold and um, we get new data in literally every day. Um, so I believe last year we processed over 400 quantitative uh, data sets, um, as well as qualitative ones on top of that. So literally every day we're adding another collection or two or more um, to our to our archive. Um, so keep having a look through and, and seeing what's there. Um, but I think any of these sorts of things would work well for dissertation. And then we do have some further resources as well. Um, so this is just a quick overview, but I just wanted to give you uh, just a few other places to look in case you are doing a reuse project. Um, so in terms of publications that are useful, if you're doing a quantitative project, I highly recommend Anna Smith's book, Using Secondary Data in Educational and Social Research. There's also a chapter in Sage's Handbook of Social Research Method on Secondary Analysis of Quantitative Data Sources. Um, we also have some data skills modules, which I mentioned at the start of this, and those can help you through the steps of statistical analysis. And for qualitative projects, there's a chapter in Silverman's qualitative research textbook on secondary analysis. And there's also a working paper series available through the Timescapes archive. Karen Hughes and Anna Tarrant have also, you know, uh, recently published a handbook of qualitative secondary analysis. This is kind of the seminal text, if you will, if you're doing secondary analysis of, of qualitative data. Um, so it's a really good text with quite a lot of information in there. And then finally, if you need help finding, accessing, or downloading data, we also have video tutorials, which will walk you through those processes with step-by-step -step instructions.
And that's all we have for you today. So um, just a reminder that the recording is going to be up on our YouTube channel. So you can check us, uh, us out on YouTube, but we're also on other social media pages. You can sign up for our just mailing lists um, or contact us through our contact us pages. Um, yeah. Thank you all for joining us. Um, yeah. And yeah, contact us through the pages, like Maureen said, and also our help desk if there's any particular um, tricky problems you've got with using data sets as well. Thank you all and good luck with your dissertations. Yeah, thanks for all the lovely comments.